Um, I just want to introduce our presenters tonight. First, we have uh, Joe Kane with MDHA, and he'll be presenting the Uptown Flats project. Um, we have Shane White and Ben Crenshaw with Southern Land, and they'll be discussing the Ellison 23 project. And then uh, David Powell and Ray Hensler uh, with the Laurel Apartments project. So um, we've got these in an order, and Joe, you're going to start first, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe Kane, I'm Director of Urban Development with MDHA here in Nashville. I uh, see very many uh, friendly faces and other folks. I'm glad you're here tonight. It is a very chilly evening and I'm glad you made it out tonight. What I'm here to talk about is Uptown Flats. Uh, this was a unique project that MDHA uh, undertook and we had a very special circumstances that took place with this. We, at the City of Nashville, applied for Neighborhood Stabilization Program funds. This was under the Obama administration. This was part of the um, trying to get out of the, the, the era funds and recovery uh, from the housing crisis that took place as a result of the, uh, of the recession. This was a competitive grant. Nashville applied. We had some nonprofit partners apply with, along with us on that. And the idea was to go into the hardest hit areas inside Davidson County. Those were located in Antioch, generally located in Antioch. There is an area down in South Nashville, uh, just south of Lake <coughs> Street in the south, in East Nashville, in the, this area where Uptown Flats is located, in, which included Dickerson Road, as well as the, the most of North Nashville. Um, on there, and there were very, very targeted since based on census tracts, and so those were the only areas that we could go to address these things. Uh, MDHA elected to construct after coming off the success of Nance Place, and Ryman was was on in route then towards being a reality. Wanted to do another project similar to that in one of these hardest hit areas, and we went out to look for areas that were along a major corridor that provide direct transportation into jobs and other amenities on the, and uh, the only areas where the, we kind of hit these statistics were either up and down Jefferson Street, but there was really only almost a two block area on Jefferson Street in the county of North Nashville and areas as well as on um, Dickerson Road. And so we ended up on Dickerson Road. We've done some work down around where the, where the sits, um, where the saw, I mean, where the, where the, I guess the nests has come together through there, and we had put in the Buffalo. Many of you may know the recognize the Buffalo on there. We had worked on our public housing out there as well, and we had done some sidewalks and some other work coming out Dickerson Road. And so this was a way to kind of complement that. It's a little bit further north where we are located. And Gatewood is right across the street from the uh, elementary school. And so with that, we were pleased we selected a site and we started to move and progress forward with that. Uh, uptown flats, three stories, 72 units. We'll classify this as workforce housing. The restrictions that came with neighborhood stabilization program is that all the funds had to be at least at 120% of median income or less. This is actually unique for MDHA. Most of what we ever construct is, is geared towards uh, households at 80% or median or less. And so with 120%, we were able to bump this up and we actually address this more as market rate. Given the location of where we were, the average income of that neighborhood was below the 120%, is actually more around 100% and down to towards between 60 and 100%. So we were constructing this completely as a market rate development moving forward with that. Um, Gatewood Avenue, uh, like I said, we're, we're further out. You can't quite, um, Ellington, I mean, uh, Trinity Lane is just off the top of the map up there, where it, where it is located. Um, you may see these unique little white lines all around here and trying to figure out what those are. Those are actually roofs of trailers. And there, we were actually adjacent to a trailer park immediately to the north and directly across the street from it. Uh, probably not the ideal location where someone would want to go in with a new housing development with that. Again, given what we do, this is, this is why this, we thought this would be a great way to give some transitional housing 
um, instead of trying to come out with a for sale product that someone would go in there, we could show them the benefits of living into this area, how close it is to downtown, what the connection is to be able to come through there and start with rental housing, and then these people can move up decide to live there. Um, later into that neighborhood, there's a good, very good housing stock uh, right behind there. You can see with, the, with all the developed trees as they came through there. Um, the site plan got developed as we came on through. We wanted to have, um, we want to capitalize on those views. That's what you see along Gatewood, uh, Gatewood Avenue and Dickerson Pike. We uh, were working on a fixed budget, and so we just we surface parked this with it as it came on through with the site plan. Um, this, as I was telling you, it was a stabilization program. We utilized five million dollars of that program. We leveraged we leveraged the remainder of it with private financing on that. Um, it was and I already discussed what that was. As you can see, though the interior finishes of this, this is a, this is the uh, community room looking down as you as you enter into the building on the uh, first floor and open up to the second floor. These uh, um, the spaces and the quality of construction on here. We were, we were trying to design this in towards, a little bit towards condo type of standards, and we were, think we were a little bit successful at that. We do not have any plans to convert this to condominium. Uh, we, we're adding this to our, to our residential stock of one of the properties that we have. It is privately managed. Um, we have this, uh, is managed by Freeman Web, currently managed by Freeman Web Company, manages the property for us. We are on track for at least for home for gold. Um, it has not been occupied for the for the tank length of time yet to go ahead and get the uh, get the certification, but we are on track for that um, with the design on the uh, on status of where we are. So we are very pleased with it. The property leased um, in full occupancy within 120 days of coming online, and so that came online back in the beginning of this year and hit in hit full occupancy in 120 days. So. It did, a, it did a phenomenal job. A, a lot of that obviously is attributed to, to the housing market here in Nashville, the demand for it, but we think a lot of it is also attributed to the location and the quality of this product, uh, as, as, as you can see with that. Um, it is one, twos, and threes. I did not touch on that, but one, two, and three bedrooms. We have, it also has two bedrooms that are set up for a roommate type of scenario, two bedroom, two bath. With that, the, um, the the size of the units range from 652 square feet for the one bedrooms to uh, uh, just over a thousand feet for the three bedrooms. Um, rents on this range from about $650 for the small one bedrooms, um, and we cap out just under a thousand dollars for the three bedrooms on this. Uh, that was based on a market study that we had done. That I think also helped fill up the rents on there. Um, we have not, of course, we haven't hit any lease renewals yet. They given the market on here, we do see some room for some move, movement on these rents into the uh, into the future with that. And so, it is a, uh, it's been, a, it's like I said, it's been a great product, and we really do, um, we were able to capitalize on this. We have one of the benefits, and one of the things that we do, and while we pick the we pick the location, and other people would sit there and go, what are you doing out there? is to try and bring that development on further on out the road. And while we were actually under construction out there, an adjoining property uh, went, under, went under renovation. It was a retail, retail building, went under renovation, brought a new tenant in there, in, just in anticipation of the product coming online. And so we, we feel like the product will have some more input as it comes through. Also on Dickerson Road, a new, a new uh, dollar store was built further on into town with that and the design standards. We have a redevelopment district on that end, on the lower end of Dickerson Road in there, and we're picking up that quality of development. And it, it's a slow going process, but people are recognizing it as it moves forward in there. And you, we have seen the reinvestment start to follow with our initial capital outlay on this. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Any quick questions for Joe? About the project, quick questions for Doug? Yes. Total construction cost? Uh, right at $8 million, about $110,000, $115,000 a year. Does MDHA retain ownership? We do. Was lead certification a requirement of the program? Uh, it was having, 
believe that per se was not, they did want to have green factors as part of the neighborhood stabilization program in it. Um, and of course, everything we do, we strive towards um, lead certification with what we are doing as well. So we are very glad to incorporate that into our product. And as I mentioned, this is an MD MDHA's inventory we're going to have for long term holding. And uh, we think it will benefit our tenants with low, low utility costs as well. Yes? What are you doing next, or what are you thinking about? Uh, good, 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 uh, good question on that. Uh, we are we are looking to do some more. Um, we have uh, we have we we uh, you may have seen in the newspaper we had attempted to get a piece of property under contract on Jefferson Street. Um, the the sellers ultimately elected to um, they, they wanted to withdraw from that, and we're going to let them out of the contract. And so we are looking for another another location to do some more housing along the lines of this. Um, don't know exactly the size or the location of that, probably something in the North Nashville area. Uh, this type of housing is needed in that area. Uh, good good quality rental housing is needed in all of the North Nashville area. We'll be looking for locations up in that area and we're coming up with a new project. Yes? Uh, where was the competition for this? Um, there really is not any direct competition with it. When they're doing the market study, they kind of had to spread out a little bit to try and find where the competition is. Um, as I, you know, as you as you saw from the photograph, we were really sitting in, in the middle of some trailer parks out there. There's not a lot right there in that immediate vicinity that wasn't subsidized housing. Okay, well, for funding. For funding? Yeah. I'm sorry. What do you, we? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought, uh, I thought you said it was a uh, program. Neighborhood stabilization program, we, and, and the application we said we we're going to be building multifamily on a major on a major corridor, and that application was accepted. So we had that funding, and then we just it's minimal amount of leverage that we utilized on that. So, yes, sir. Are you guys looking to do any any of these PEPs? Well, we we do a lot of public private partnerships. That's generally done through inside our redevelopment <laughs> districts. Through, um, through through tax increment financing. We also have a program where we utilize home funds. We are looking for private developers. We invest into those projects through that. We do competitive process through that side as well with that. And we look for for-profit as well as non-profit developers on doing such projects. Those would generally be though, as far as the home funds go, restricted down to lower incomes at 60% of median income with multifamily development. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> good evening. Um, I'm Shane White. I'm with Southern Land Company. Uh, I'm a senior planner and landscape architect with Southern Land. And I'm actually um, excited because about six months ago we did a presentation with ULI and there's a lot of faces that I did not see there so uh, the, if, for those of you that were at that presentation the good news is we've got a ton of photos now that the project's been much further along and completed so uh, there'll still be some excitement here. Um, Southern Land Company, for those that don't know, we're a 25 year old company we started in Chattanooga, we're now in Franklin, Tennessee um, we've got about 20 uh, projects under our belt, and um, we, I guess about 2009, started looking for urban infill opportunity. And <clears throat> one of the projects that came up was, uh, was the site that we're going to talk about. It's called Elliston 23. It's an apartment project, mixed-use project that's uh, over off of Elliston Place here in Nashville. Um, very excited, been very successful, um, so we're going to get into some details of it. Uh, I guess one thing to kind of point out that's makes Southern Land a little bit different, some of you that are familiar already know this, but uh, we are a vertically integrated company, so uh, what that means and why it's important to mention it for this particular project is our owner Tim Downey always had the dream of having everybody in-house, so that means architects, engineers, um, just about everything is in-house besides structure and MEP. It doesn't mean that we don't use consultants quite regularly, it just means that there's a, there's a strong design team in the firm and 
in this particular case, uh, we did, uh, we were the developer, the architect, the civil engineer, the LA, uh, the landscape architect, and then the general contractor uh, for this project. So it was exciting to have that culmination of all of our fields in, in the office come together on this project. So for those who have been in Nashville for a long time, you may realize or may know that the Father Ryan High School, which is now south of town, was located on this particular site. Um, and it was uh, basically one full block prior to that. It was uh, older single family homes that were taken down. But around the early 90s, the Father Ryan High School was taken down. They moved south. And um, on the other side of it is a Hampton Inn now. Um, and it left, us, left a piece of property um, that was 2.7 acres. So, point it right here. Um, one of the things that when we started in 2009 looking for a piece of property, um, size was important, we wanted to get a bulk of units. Um, Nashville was important that we wanted to be in Nashville. And then with the idea of being, you know, proximity to jobs, proximity to uh, major hospitals that are nearby, Vanderbilt, of course, um, all of the action that's happening down in the Gulch, there really wasn't much happening on this end of downtown, but it was still very well connected and, and centrally located. And so, this piece of property um, was available for quite some time actually before we, we made the offer on it in, in one, one site. So uh, looking back towards downtown Nashville, uh, you can see Music City Center, the Gulch, um, the CAT Financial Headquarters in Germantown, um, but Ellison Place running here, which turns into Church Street, takes you right downtown. Um, you know, the transit ability that's all around here, oh, you can see the the Hampton Inn that was built on the other half of the, the site. And then looking back to the uh, south, um, we had the uh, Centennial Sports Complex, the One and Two American Center, um, of course the Centennial Park. Um, all of those things made this such an appeal to us um, just from the, having those public amenities close by. Um, and so it made a lot of sense for us to, to make an offer on it. Um, The, uh, the site itself was, uh, was a, pretty much a blank slate when we got, when we got it. They had already taken down the, the high school itself. Uh, Hampton Inn had been built for some time, uh, but you can, these photos are a little hard to see. But there was a few trees on it. There was uh, quite a bit of grade change on it to deal with. Um, some existing walls around the site, but pretty much just a, an open blank slate. Uh, what's kind of important, just it more as we get zoom in here to the site, is everything that you have going on with exit in and rotiers and all of those things on uh, what they call the rock block uh, portion of Ellison Place. And then of course you've got the commercial and 2525 and all that happening on this end. And so there was really just this kind of one block stretch in here that was dead and it's kind of started to seam all that together. Uh, and that's something, you know, besides the walkability of all that, we want, really wanted to start focusing on trying to pull all that together. Um, Again, mentioned uh, Rotiers and Gold Rush, all of those things contribute to the neighborhood and then being in an established neighborhood, um, and it's not downtown, but there's so many good things about the, the Elliston Place already, and we just didn't, we didn't want to take away from that, we just wanted to add to it and be a part of it. We'll talk about the design a little bit. Um, Elliston Place down here, this is the Hampton Inn side on this side. So, we looked at a lot of different things for this, and again, I think I mentioned, but this is a multifamily project, and there's mixed use uh, component being the, the retail and restaurants, which is just along Ellison Place. And Ben will get, get into some more details on that. Um, we laid this thing out a bunch of different ways, um, trying to figure out what was best, and probably the, the one thing that stands out about Ellison 23 versus a lot of the other projects, um, at least that are in this mid-rise or more recently have been built, I should say, um, is that it's all concrete. It's a six-story building. Um, we want it to last forever. It was important to us. Um, and I should mention too, we, we closed on the land for 10.65 million, just to throw some numbers at you. This ended up being over a $60 million project. It's a 90-10 split with J.P. Morgan. Um, and uh, there's something else I was gonna throw in there too. Oh, uh, 
the target yield on it was an eight, and it was underwritten at dollar seventy one rents. Um, and right now, it's tracking north of a nine yield, and we're averaging above two twelve on the rents right now. So uh, it's been again something that's it's very successful. Um, getting back to the design, we did want to make sure there was um, the existing zoning on the site was office residential, so we could build this by right. We had to get some uh, exceptions. Uh, through the BZA for the height and for some setback, um, and they're relatively minor, but uh, everything went through smoothly. We made sure to have the garage completely wrapped by building, the exception where we have our loading or loading sur uh, and service area off of Brandau Place. Um, it's a seven and a half level garage, 500 parking spaces, 331 residential units, and about 15,000 square feet of retail. And if you've been over there, when you enter off of Ellison Place, you actually drive under the building, so the units actually span this portion of it. Um, you see the three courtyards, you know, creating community is a big part of um, what we're trying to do and what I think is going to be the, the future. A lot of folks want to be with others, and so what we're trying to do is take a lot of the things we do on the inside and the attention to detail there, take it outside as well. Um, so we had the, the pool, and Ben's going to get a lot more detail on these, but we had three courtyards, two that opened up to Brandau Place, and then one centrally located where the pool was located at. And just a little more detail, again, Ben's going to walk you through these, the two smaller courtyards that are on Brandau. Um, as far as the, the streetscape goes, one of the more interesting things too is that this was recently, um, or it came online right after the mayor had signed the Complete Streets Initiative uh, that was passed, and so we were the first major project to, to apply that. And it, it took a lot of work um, to understand it, to understand exactly what was being required, um, what we actually provided in the way of right of way. We gave, uh, there's room out there for a bike lane in the future. Um, and all this was kind of negotiated with Metro Public Works that they wanted those items, but it was our land, so trying to divvy up and figure out how best we make it all work at the end of the day for everyone. Um, and and it, came, it came together quite well. Um, so it, it, they talked about the, the frontage zone and the pedestrian zone and then the furnishing zone. And so you can kind of see this is the built project itself. Uh, you can see that all kind of occurring along Ellison Place, and it, it carries all the way around. Um, just a quick detail, one thing that I had mentioned, um, the wall that was out there on the site, we were able to reuse that, and so the walls that you see, while it doesn't carry all the way around the entire site, we, we made sure to keep it, and then uh, they reused it to build the, the seat walls that we have out there. <coughs> And I'm not an architect, but I'll talk a little bit about the architecture and what we were trying to create. This was a, obviously a rendering of what we were trying to achieve out there on site. And, you know, we always talk a lot about the first 30 feet of a building. That's what people really feel, see, and touch. But from, as you stand away from the building, it was important with our additional height that we blend in with the neighborhood as much as possible. There was obviously buildings nearby that have... Um, taller height even, but in the Hampton Inn is taller, but not so much right up on the street like we were going to be. So we had to, I'll call it transitional architecture, where we kind of mix the brick in. Um, you know, there's stucco, stucco on the building, there's some modern elements in there, there's traditional elements in there. And so we felt like it was a good balance for, for what we were trying to achieve. And I'll kind of flip through these images relatively quick, but these are, this is the actual built structure obviously prior to um, our corner uh, restaurant being in there. But uh, you start to get a feel from that rendering what we were able to achieve, and it, it turned out pretty well um, from our perspective on, uh, you know, it doesn't always translate from rendering to what's happening on the, on the actual built form. So uh, it turned out well. You see, the, uh, this is the entryway I was talking about into the parking garage off of Elliston. This is our leasing center. That glass wraps all the way around the corner, which was important just so you identify where people need to go as they're pulling in, <clears throat> make it a little more inviting. Um, streetscape-wise, you know, again, all the elements that we talk about with complete streets, but 
uh, Tim and our company as a whole is really big in color. Obviously, these have been highlighted a little bit, but there is a lot of color that we put out there on the street, whether it be balloons, whether it be tables, whether it be umbrellas, flowers, a lot of flowers, pots, flowers layering the streetscape. Um, just adds to a little bit more um, authentic, I guess, to the, and we, we, all of our retailers, we try and get them to do, we review all the signage, make sure the signage uh, kind of meets with our expectations, um, get them involved in what's happening out on the street so they can create that activity that we're, that we're trying to do. Uh, you can see a nice shot of the, the streetscape and then some attention to the detail that we tried to put on Ellison Place that didn't go into the interior courtyards by using mesh versus spindles on the roofs. I'm going to flip through this really quick, but it's kind of cool that uh, this is 12 24 2011. We just started pouring foundation. It's kind of a time lapse. You can see in the progress of the building go up. So 621 2013, the, essentially the structure was done um, and then had lots of interior stuff to go. Um, one thing to mention to Lead Silver, we, uh, last time, my understanding is we will be getting the uh, commission this quarter. Um, we had 51 of 50 required points for Lead Silver, so um, I believe that still stands right now. I'll let Ben take over from here. Any questions for Shane before these steps? <laughs> no, I'm happy to answer anything. And uh, I have at least uh, 100 more photos, so I'll go through this really quickly in the interest of time. Uh, but again, 331 units, average about 100, or, uh, 824 square feet is the, is the unit average, up to about uh, 1,100, I think I've got this in here, 1,150 or so is the, is the largest unit, yeah, 11, or 1,363, uh, 15,000 square feet of retail. A little bit about the market. We, uh, as Shane said, we this is almost a can't miss on a on a multifamily project with Baptist, with Centennial, with Vanderbilt, all within walking distance. Uh, this is there are a lot of jobs and a lot of students right in this general vicinity. But we feel it's a real obligation to create. He used that word community. We feel it's a real obligation from our side to create. A place that people love, even though they're renters, there that they love and will want to stay there. So, and as a part of this, setting a, a real identity. I, I, I had two good friends of mine that I walked through and did, an, uh, did a uh, tour with, and we walked into the amenity center, and and this is the leasing area as you're coming on and off the street, and these are two guys that should know better, but they were standing there and they. I, I told them, wait a second, that we're in, in, in the leasing office, and they thought it was a, as a um, furniture store. Which is <laughs> not, not one single piece of furniture in there that's the same. Um, but again, it's sort of setting that character. Once you get off of the street, once you get into the project, you're in a whole different world that, that people uh, are really identifying with. We've been trying to pinpoint what is warm contemporary for years now. That's been our direction of what we're trying to provide, and if anybody can help with that, let us know. But this is our stab at um, Again, all the, a lot of the typical amenities that you would see, uh, but in a place, in a, in a way, layout that's very flexible, uh, mm -hmm. that we allow um, small groups to large groups. It's a big, uh, space planning is a big uh, concern of ours within the amenity areas and the outside areas as well, trying to provide as much space, uh, flexible space, because we, we've learned that over-programming is, is not good for, uh, for, for living. So these are the outdoor courtyards, that is the uh, synthetic turf that just got put in these last week or so. Uh, pool area, uh, it's seating for about 60, it's about a 1,500 square foot pool, um, and it, going back, um, all you planners out there, plan for a little bit larger than 90 by 90 for your courtyard. Um, you need just a little bit more space. This is very tight. Again, designing, designing pools for, for living, uh, not, not swimming. Uh, a lot of perimeter, a lot of edge. TVs, we have three big TVs out here, two large cabanas. Um, this is... Um, <laughs> You know, it really fits with the style of the rest of the building. So again, the interiors, um, 
there was a lot of exposed concrete. They, they were sort of going for an urban loft style, of both on the amenity areas and the um, the units. This is the sixth floor. Shane, is this the sixth or the fourth? Yes, sir. This is the sixth floor corner unit. That's that 1,300 square foot unit that's on the corner. And again, the rents have been pushing up $2.12, $2.14. Uh, and these were the first ones that, that, oddly enough, the most expensive units were the first ones to go. But again, there's exposed concrete on the, on the ceilings, uh, some of the beams. Um, again, condo kind of level finishes for the interior. As much as anything else, we see leasing as an amenity. Um, we have in our, our own in-house leasing um, group. and. We think we're trying not just to fill, it would be easy to fill all these spaces with a different bank and they would probably pay as much rent or more than anybody else. But that has nothing to do with the community, it has nothing to do with the, with the people that are living in our, in our um, project. So four out of the seven are food service, uh, workout, um, a salon, and a spa. So um, really trying to take um, advantage of the good streetscape that we have, the good positioning that we have, um, and providing amenities for the residents. And I'm, I'm going to say this not to toot our own horn, but as, as the discussion progresses, we're in these other markets and are building other buildings um, that are, some are more dense, some are less dense, some are more suburban, some are very urban. Uh, and as, as, the, as the discussion goes, Gary into what is the future of housing, um, we're seeing a lot of things in other markets that will be applied to the Nashville market. Uh, hopefully it won't be, won't be too much longer. Um, but from um, Philadelphia to, to Texas, some of, the, some of the project components that we look for, and they, again, it goes to this discussion of what other uh, housing needs would be met. Um, from, we're, we're lucky to be patient. Um, and, and choosy about the projects that we're able to take on. So a lot of these, a lot of other uh, development <coughs> are not going to be able to, to be patient enough to find the right projects, but transit, um, good public amenities nearby, um, really paying attention to the floor plans of the units, um, density and population growth, and as well as job growth, those are, the, those are the real drivers for us, no matter which market it is. Um, so, that's it. Anybody questions? Okay, I try to be quick. Yes, sir. What kind of rates would you give on your commercial space? <coughs> Let me do my. I thought I had done all my homework, and I've got it right here. Um, anybody else have a question while I'm looking at it? Is it occupied now? It is 100% occupied. Uh, all spaces, but the corner space. Uh, there's a sushi restaurant that's going in. Uh, it will be, um, they're starting their TI right now. Uh, $32 net. Um, let's see, we're, we're parking at about six per thousand. We didn't, we didn't reserve that many because there are going to be, there's a pretty decent amount of sharing. Uh, the TI is going to be 35 for the retail and 65 for the restaurants. So, yes, sir. What cities which fit in your work in are comparable to Nashville, and which are the direction that you see Nashville go? Um, Raleigh is probably a, a really close um, uh, comparison, I, I, and I think they're probably farther along with their with their. It's a it's almost the same scale and size project as as on Elliston, uh, and we are one of many within their downtown kind of core. So I think they're probably wouldn't you say? Five or six years ahead, um, from a from a density standpoint, um, that's almost a, a direct comparison. Um, Philadelphia, we're in has a high rise that is we're in West Philadelphia, right next to the Penn campus. Um, but Raleigh, we, it's not on transit, but we are looking for every. We've got a, two projects in in Plano, Texas, that are right on the dark line, um, that are relatively close to the same scale. Um, what we're looking for is exactly what we what we found in Nashville is that again it's close to uh, population centers with growth. Uh, and it's as much of transit as we can possibly get, and to be a complement to the existing neighborhood. That's a that's a big big uh, part of our criteria for new new projects. 
Anybody else? Thank you very much. Yes. This is Mary Mary before our discussion about financing a property like this. You talked a little bit about that side of it. Um, as Shane said, this was a this was a 90-10 split between our investors and, and us. Um, we have a we have an established relationship with, with a, a couple of um, funds that um, are providing the capital for our project. Uh, the Raleigh project, there was no debt financing on it, it was an all cash deal. So they, they kind of pick and choose which ones they want to do uh, that way. But we are, because we are in um, such, we have such a good relationship with our investors, we're able to go and find those projects and they have basically given this sort of um, an amount of money and said we would like to do projects that are comparable to say an Ellison or another another type of project. We go out and find a pitch to them and, and they're ready to go because the, the once the, the equity for those partners is secured, the debt financing is relatively easy. So they, they've, um, typically it's 65-35, um, between equity is 35% and the debt is 60%. So we as a company provide a small portion of that equity <coughs> and our investors will provide the rest. Does that kind of answer your question? Right. Um, on a project of this size, how many full-time employees would you say it takes for all those building services? And do you in-house do a lot of that or is it? Uh, we have an in-house. Uh, where property management is, is in-house. We have um, one general manager, uh, three, no, two, one assistant and three leasing consultants, and we have three full-time, uh, no, two full-time and one half-time uh, building services employees. So six or so, our, our threshold is usually about 200 units. If we're independent, we're, to property management-wise, if you get below 200, it's very difficult for us to make that uh, work from a property management perspective. So we're always, 200 is about our, our uh, threshold. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. David Powell. I am principal and an architect with Hastings Architecture. Uh, it's a great crowd tonight considering how cold it was, uh, or it is, was today, is today. Um, just a quick shout out uh, on this project. We have some amazing people on our team helping and quite a few folks are here tonight. The folks from Hawkins Partners and contractor J.E. Dunn guys in the back and uh, Guys from our office, Taylor Wells and, and Mark Zook, who were uh, up in this building today on this frigid day. Um, so, uh, appreciate everybody being here. So, this project has been called Laurel Apartments uh, pretty much since uh, the inception, but it's always been a working name, so there might be some confusion uh, when you see this. But just last week, uh, it was uh, announced and unveiled and unfurled if you've seen the building recently a very very large banner on the side of the building that is announcing the uh, the actual name of the project which is 1212 uh, that is the address it's 1212 laurel uh, so uh, just to get your bearings here this is uh, 12th avenue and this is laurel uh, going down into the gulch and i'll show you some aerials to give you a little bit more specific context in a, in a moment uh, the, the best way to start describing this project and also trying to keep it in the context of what uh, uh, what we're talking about tonight and the variety of the three different projects, um, I think it's best to start uh, with our initial conversation with the developer and mastermind behind the project, which is Ray Hensler, who's here hiding behind me. So, uh, but don't worry, he'll get up and speak, I can promise you that. So. Um, so, uh, Ray was uh, uh, involved in the, the Adelisha, the, the highly successful Adelisha project, and 
came to us uh, after that and, and having learned a great deal through that process. But if you can remember, think back when that project went online and what happened to uh, the economy uh, right after uh, that project uh, very successfully, uh, thankfully sold out, um, uh, but, but residential and multifamily uh, started changing uh, dramatically, if you'll recall. So this project starts as far back as those early dark days and, and his vision for uh, what is going to happen uh, to the future of uh, multifamily residential uh, in this city as well as in, in this country and a uh, true visionary. And, and so a lot of initial conversations led to um, more specific planning and, and uh, starting to draw some lines and, and think about um, uh, uh, efficiencies and, and, and how to build the, the mousetrap. And so the, the, the term that we uh, talked about and, and used and, and for me personally learned uh, many years ago uh, that is something that was starting to develop on the coast and is making its way inward uh, is the term or the phrase renter by choice. And in Portland and Seattle and San Francisco, uh, a lot of West Coast and then slowly some of the East Coast cities and and even into uh, um, some really progressive cities like Austin <clears throat> that aren't quite as large but certainly forward thinking, uh, this idea of renter by choice uh, started uh, cropping up. And <clears throat> what that means in a nutshell is a really, really high end uh, rental uh, product. And the idea, and, and I'm sure Ray will elaborate on this a bit more, but the idea is that. Um, um, Maybe the best way I can describe this is actually thinking about it from a, a corporate office standpoint. Uh, we have seen a big trend in moving from the classic uh, hard wall offices uh, with um, you know support group outside of the office into more of an open office environment. And with that comes the need for a lot of support spaces and a lot of amenity spaces. So as people's workspaces get smaller, in square foot per person, the need for amenity spaces to support that uh, becomes greater. So there's a lot of shared amenity spaces. So thinking about that from a residential standpoint, uh, and especially the, the multifamily standpoint, the target market here is for folks that are moving from a larger home into a smaller um, uh, unit that is part of a community uh, and a mixed use uh, or, or multifamily situation so or, or possibly they have the choice to go into a larger home but choose to be in a different uh, condition and so with that comes the need to uh, create a higher level of finishes and uh, amenity spaces and, and higher quality uh, uh, environments uh, to, to make up the difference and so um, as we started developing this 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 concept and looking at the the economics of how the situation you know, starts to play out, it led us to, to, to realize quickly that uh, the, the, there's a, um, we had to place a great deal of importance on construction efficiency. And the more we can make the, uh, the bones of the building, the structure and the infrastructure uh, for the systems efficient, uh, the more that allows us to put uh, money from the total construction budget into amenities, higher level of finishes, and, and the details that people are coming to expect for a renter by choice product, okay? Anything you want to add to that as I move forward? Okay, so, <clears throat> see if I can make this snazzy thing. Okay, so everybody will recognize downtown in the stadium across the river, just a point of orientation, so we're looking east in this view. Uh, this is the gulch area with the interstate coming through uh, on the west side of downtown and the train tracks. Uh, Velocity, Icon, Terrazzo. So obviously, obviously there has been um, a lot of success in the gulch for a residential product and a lot of momentum that was uh, stalled, of course, uh, briefly in the uh, downturn, uh, but you know, I'm probably a bit biased, but it's really, really exciting to not only see a crane, uh, but to see, well, two, 
uh, now, now one, but for a while there, for two cranes to be in the air and to know that it was a residential product was pretty exciting for our city, I think. So uh, those cranes were uh, for this, this project, which is 1212. Uh, this is Demumbrium, and this is 12 going down into the, the, the heart of the gulch, uh, at least as it currently is. So, as I mentioned, uh, this is at the intersection of, of Laurel and 12. This is part of a larger master plan for the entire city block that we did quite a few years ago for uh, the developer, John Aiken. And uh, this went through a SP process and uh, was um, master planned by us to have a, uh, an office component on the north side and a residential component mm -hmm. on the south half of the lot. And it's very close to a 50-50 split in terms of how it works uh, in, in plan and, and land use. So the proximity to the interstate and the exchange and the, um, um, the gulch, uh, as well as the downtown and convention center and walking distance to what seems like everything and how exciting the memory is, is very, very exciting and, and helps a great deal with this product type. Uh, not to mention the other direction, and it's very close proximity to um, Vanderbilt and um, healthcare world uh, by, uh, uh, by Vanderbilt, and of course Belmont and Music Row. And you can probably imagine that this, uh, this product type uh, lends itself to people that are uh, associated with the entertainment industry and the music industry, and, and there's already been quite a bit of interest from, from those folks for, uh, for this unit. So uh, that's a, a bit of orientation. Some, some quick numbers, it's 23 uh, stories tall, and uh, there is about 325,000 square feet of residential, uh, which is uh, 288 units. <clears throat> there is a retail component on the ground floor that's uh, 6,800 square feet, uh, but it uh, it's, uh, does not take up uh, a great deal of the first floor, just enough to have a really good anchor uh, corner piece there, or, or possibly two tenants, depending on what they are. So this is 12th, and this is Laurel, which dead ends going into the interstate. And there at the end of Laurel is the, uh, this is actually bleeding a little bit so you don't see as much of the detail, but this is the entrance into the parking garage. There's also an access off of Laurel that helps with uh, valet parking and being able to make the loop for what is presumably a restaurant that will be a future restaurant. And this is the residential <coughs> uh, entry and, and lobby. And this is a blown up version of that. Uh, that has uh, office spaces for uh, leasing agents and uh, conference room <clears throat> for the tenants, uh, security desk, access off of the parking deck, as well as from the street into a secured elevator lobby uh, with uh, a mail room. And then making our way up the building, uh, it, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we spent a great deal of time talking about the efficiencies and talking about the parking deck and what, in our experience, collective experience has been uh, kind of deal killers or the kiss of death for projects uh, of similar uh, types of residential and high-rise residential. And so almost rule number one was don't go below grade. And so, especially in this part of the country, uh, so trying to avoid the, the, the extreme cost of going down and the rock that we would hit. And so this is uh, essentially all above grade parking and as you can tell, it's an extremely simple diagram that is just a, a rectangle that is more or less property line to property line, uh, maximizing the square footage, but with an extremely uh, efficient footprint. As part of the SP, thankfully, uh, there was a requirement and an agreement to uh, line uh, the parking deck as much as possible. So there are some residential units uh, on uh, floors uh, to three, and four. And this is a typical tower plan, which at this scale is probably a bit jumbled, but I'll get into some units uh, in a moment. But you can see from this footprint, again, it's an extremely simple, very efficient footprint, again, to, to minimize uh, increased uh, structural costs 
and uh, uh, maximizing the efficiency so money can be spent in places that are more tangible for uh, the, the users. This is the amenity deck, which was uh, extremely, extremely important to this concept and making sure that the amenity level with the residence lounge and the fitness component and then of course the exterior amenity. Um, this was very important to the concept. This is a 20,000 square foot amenity deck, just the exterior component alone is 20,000 square feet. And <clears throat> we made the decision both economically uh, how the parking deck worked as well as the opportunity to uh, let that drive the decision to create different environments depending on what type of atmosphere that you would like to have if you're leaving your unit and want to go outside. Is it uh, a wet atmosphere or a party deck atmosphere or is it something a bit more intimate? Uh, and and you know, the, the views of course are very, very different from, from one to the other. Um, this masterpiece of course was driven uh, a great deal by the, the fine folks at Hawkins. Thank you again, Gary. So, uh, zooming in a bit more uh, on, well, hopefully, maybe not. Did it just lock up? None of those transitions. Nope, but not supposed to be. You're doing a fine job making your transition. <laughs> so let me just, I'll just use this then. Uh, what I was going to show you were enlarged slides of these two areas. Uh, this is the west deck that um, is adjacent to the interstate, but of course we're on the fifth floor and the interstate is, is depressed, so it's uh, quite a ways away uh, uh, visually as well as acoustically, uh, but, but is nonetheless on the west side of the building and uh, has different uh, water-related atmospheres as well as uh, cabanas and a uh, fire pit and grilling and, and kind of more intimate uh, areas away from the pool. Um, a large uh, uh, wall of trees uh, with uh, sloped benches and, and uh, uh, more uh, private uh, reclining areas here. And, and everything that you see in green, uh, especially as you get to, to the east deck, uh, these are all uh, different plant types, there's a, a great deal of variety, which is uh, very exciting, I think. Um, that actually gets into something that's quite interesting and unique, which is uh, a garden area. Um, and, and there's a lot of different forms that that may take, but it's intended to be uh, something that's a bit more uh, organic, no pun intended. Uh, but it's supposed to take on a bit of a life of its own, either for the restaurant down below or for the tenants, uh, either either of those concepts are exciting. It just depends on what the restaurant type is like, uh, uh, operator is like. But in this area, again, you have uh, more private uh, sloped uh, benches, uh, built-in uh, seating for more intimate environments, uh, some more modern fire pit uh, area, uh, kind of, uh, loose seating uh, around these fire pits. And this area, as well as this area, are both covered um, pergola areas that have uh, this one in particular has a bar uh, associated with it and grills for larger parties. This one, of course, slightly smaller. Both of them have TVs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then a lawn uh, that the fitness uh, spills out onto. And then um, seating along this rail, uh, primarily because this is a phenomenal view of downtown. Just a really, really spectacular view of downtown, which makes this maybe the best fitness facility on the planet so, in the world. A, oh, there's a dead slide. So this is an enlarged plan of the resident lounge, which, just to make sure we're oriented here, is this piece here. The resident lounge is actually divided into two uh, major spaces, uh, one of which is a little bit more of a, a kitchen environment, so it has a uh, large uh, demonstration cooktop area to bring in guest chefs and, and for uh, uh, tenants to be able to use a, a, a large commercial kitchen uh, environment uh, with you know fireplace and living room type seating and different outdoor and indoor seating 
in this uh, more kitchen slash uh, breakfast nook, if you will, kind of area. Whereas this side becomes more um, more formal um, and, and perhaps a bit more uh, cozy, uh, for lack of a better word. A lot of built-in upholstered uh, seating and a lot of uh, soft seating in and around this area and a bar atmosphere so and, and a large uh, uh, fireplace as well. So uh, amenities become a little bit more uh, like a, a, a large living room, large kitchen environment that is, again, supplementing that, um, that downsizing from a larger home, let's say. And then lastly, there are, uh, I'll quickly flip through just a few examples of units. So you can see a variety of the unit uh, sizes. Uh, and it's a bit hard to tell on this slide, but uh, some of the uh, different um, uh, finishes, uh, of course, uh, uh, beautiful wood floors that we're very, very excited about because that's something that doesn't always make it into uh, these types of uh, projects. And that was very important to us uh, right away. So these, there's a variety of different wood finishes and uh, quartz countertops and very, very high-end appliances and, and uh, uh, rest, uh, bathroom fixtures um, <clears throat> and uh, a good mix of one bedroom and two bedroom. <clears throat> Uh, units and then these are some examples of the top floor, uh, the 23rd floor uh, units, uh, uh, the penthouse, uh, uh, if you will. And I believe that's it. So, is there anything you want to add to all this? Correct. <laughs> um, no, I, I think yeah, Dave covered most of it. Um, yeah, the key the key thing he touched on was really the fact. Early on, when we got together, it was really about figuring out how to make this building efficient. You know, I mean, we sit, we sat around probably for four months, five months, with with like nothing but calculators and you know and plans, Sales spreadsheets, spreadsheets, really just trying to get the efficiency, you know, refined over and over and over. Because you know, I just know from experience that if you can if you can if you can get the building itself, uh, the building components efficient. Um, and you have an efficient garage and you have an efficient floor plate that that's going to ultimately free up more of your budget for the things that people people really care about um, So we, we spent an awful lot of time on that actually went back to the city a few times had to get some help with some you know some at one point we had uh, you know, We had the, the residential actually came around and, and, and extended a little bit beyond this and the city worked with us and you know we, we obviously are going to make it look terrific, but but that was creating a pinch in our garage that was happening all the way up through the building that, you know, again, was, was, was going to create problems for us uh, elsewhere. Um, David mentioned that, you know, the interior is being where we wanted to spend money and, and, and find budget dollars, but, but, you know, I'll say we also, you know, were able to, you know, it was also it was a priority right from the beginning to make sure that this, this efficient box didn't look like a box, that it had an elegant form to it. Um, and so, you know, rather than just doing the um, clear anodized window mullions that you typically see, which is the cheapest way to go. Um, you know, we spent over a quarter of a million dollars on, on the, just the color of the mullions themselves. Um, and then untold dollars, I don't even, know, I didn't even ask, um, <laughs> about you know, the, the mullion pattern, which is somewhat intricate in the sense that it's this box that is divided. Um, it's this big glass box, but this, this uh, architectural aluminum panel kind of divides it in two and actually no one really knows this yet. This, this goes around and then returns along the north side of the tower at the top, and then comes back down the tower on just like this, back and lands kind of on the pool deck at the entrance where you where you walk out onto the deck. Um, we also have glass handrails, no aluminum picket rails, which you, know, you saw in a lot of a lot of, of high rises in the uh, in the last go round. So, um, you know, anyway, Hastings. Hawkins did a fantastic job of really helping us once we got the efficiency that we wanted, really helping us, you know, have a lot of architectural significance to the uh, to the outside of the building and to the inside of the building. We have the slides. Yes, just in the plans, just one thing that uh, yeah, that's fine. We'll, we'll uh, um, you know, a lot of thought went into the plans and how people live. One of the things that we learned at the Abolition was was that you know we were we were basically downsizing people from Green Hills and Williamson County and and so eighteen hundred square feet in the multifamily world is a is an enormous unit 
if you're talking to somebody who's just who's living in 6,000 feet or 5,000 feet, they can't get their head around 1,800 feet, and um, and so that was that was that was a big challenge with the Adelisha that, that we we overcame, and actually so much so that the that the larger two bedroom units ended up being you know, really the price per square foot drivers in the, in the project, um, which normally you see the one bedrooms or the smaller units driving price per square foot, but there was so much demand. You know, somebody that's coming, selling a, a $1.5 million home and moving into an $800,000 condo, they're not really thinking price per square foot, they're thinking they just put a lot of money in their pocket, and if the condo works and it, and it, and it has the characteristics and the, and the features that are important to the way that they live, um, you know, that's, that's really their priority. And so, you know, one of the characteristics of the Adelisha and, and as well as this, this project are really open spaces, open plans. Um, you know, you see like in this one bedroom, you know, a real connection between that, that outside glass and the kitchen and the living area. Um, you know, we have a seven foot wall here so that you really get, you know, terrific ceiling height and real, real sense of openness to the unit. Um, and then, you know, this, this all just basically working as kind of one room, but yet you know it's kind of defined. However, however, someone ultimately determines that they want to want to ultimately set it up. But but you know it's uh, it's pretty simple. Um, you know it's it's a living area and a kitchen and a dining area, and then it's two bedrooms and you know a laundry room and a little office. Um, but you know king size beds. Um, you know large large kitchens. Um, you know generous. Master baths, for the most part, um, are, are what, what these folks were, uh, were looking for. And then, talking a little bit about, um, you know, David touched on it. When people are downsizing or they're they're you know they're taking less space than they think that they ultimately like to have, one of the things that they really uh, it's really important to them is having amenity space that's not just the you know check the box. We've got the party room or we've got the fitness center that nobody really goes into. People really want to use these, these spaces and if you can design them in a way to where they're, they're more functional, then whether it's rent or whether it's an HOA fee, people feel like they're getting value and so you know, they, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're more willing to, um, you know, to, to, to sign on if they, if they, if they sense that. So in this project, um, we actually probably doubled the, the, uh, the, the resident lounge area of what we had in the Adelisha. Um, and this has basically been set up so that it's, instead of it being a party room or you know, an area where you need 100 people to make it feel good, it's really, these are all just absolutely gorgeous hardwood floors. And as David mentioned, mentioned, we have fireplaces here and here with TVs over the fireplaces, a big quartz island. You know, custom walnut cabinets back here. What we really want you know, is people to come down and in the morning, basically feel like they're walking into a one and a half, two million dollar home in terms of the level of quality of all the finishes and the furnishings. You know, this being a kitchen, this being kind of the living area, and this maybe feeling a little bit more loungy, um, and 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 so that people feel like they, you know, they would want to use it, come down and get their coffee, you know, look at their tablet, talk to people, not talk to people. Um, you know the. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to create an environment where people could feel like they could work there, um, and they could have a meeting and you know call whoever and have two or three people come over and you know find a place that's comfortable. I mean, you go to Pinewood Social now. I mean, breakfast, lunch, dinner, late night, early. I mean, people are just there all the time. They don't want to leave. And and I you know I think um, I'd like to say we saw that before we did all this, um, but it it, it really it. it it really is is this it's a similar type of environment type of an environment that we're trying to create so that again people don't feel like their their go no go decision is, is all about the unit the unit's got to be terrific but we want the, the amenity spaces to be uh, to be terrific too. Um, sorry to interrupt. But we have ten minutes left, so I just want to be sure that we get to the panel and then we'll have an opportunity for everybody to interact. Terrific. Can fine. Yeah. Into that? yeah, we'll do that really quickly in the of David, if you could grab these chairs and get one of them here, and I'll ask all of our uh, presenters and Captain Miller's going to join us from the planning department. We'll uh, be able to kind of answer questions from the city scale.
So, Catherine, I'm going to put you on the spot just to start with. All right. Um, I, want, I know everybody's, um, hopefully, especially in this crowd, everyone's participated in Nashville Next, and it's kind of heard some of the projections for growth for the future of Nashville. But um, could you just kind of give us a, um, a view of what, because the conversation today is uh, growing towards 2040. So uh, let me just turn your volume up. So what is Nashville in 2040 projected to, to look like population? Right. Well, Nashville in 2040 has 200,000 more people in the county and um, have a lot more older folks, a lot of more um, single person households. So we're going to be looking at different, different housing types. Um, to now, you know, there's been the focus on the single suburban house. And so, you know, with the projects we've seen here today, there's going to be a lot more focus on urban living and um, complete neighborhoods where you can get all your work, live, and play in one place. So, um, we've kind of we've seen projects that are mostly on urban corridors here, and um, maybe Joe, you can you've kind of talked about what those are, you know they're doing with the scale of from the MBHA. Could you talk a little bit about affordability? I mean, we've we've seen a range of prices. But, and then we'll get into the other end of that conversation, but I just... Joe and I have been about that today. Okay. What was your conversation about? Uh, it, it's, it's about the hardest question that we have, is how do you keep affordability as it moves forward, and how do you keep the working class a, a, a place to be able to live, and what is it? And, and we don't have the answer yet. Um, it, it's, it's an all-inclusive... We can't just build product that rents out for two and a half bucks a foot. It, it's, people can't afford it. The, 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 person, the person who comes in and, and cleans your office at the end of the day can't afford two and a half bucks a foot to live somewhere. Um, and what has happened in the past is we've kind of pushed them out. They, they may live out in the Antioch area, and, the, and then all of a sudden now they're out at a place that it takes them 35 minutes to drive into downtown to where their employment is. And so it's, it's an ever important question, and it's not an easy answer. And that's what National Next is taking a look at, trying to figure out what is the best way to address that. And there are multiple ideas that are out there, and we haven't really narrowed in on any one specific on it as to how they, how they answer that question. But um, it has got to be a part of 2040. Um, National cannot just be a place where people who are making six-figure income can live. It's got to be a place where everybody can live. So where are 200 plus thousand people going to go? <laughs> <laughs> and how are people going to deal with that? Well, right now we're, we're uh, putting together scenarios um, that will run through the computer model to kind of figure that out. We'll run those up to the public in the spring. Um, so whether it's, you know, um, continuation of what we're doing right now with the kind of hub and spoke system of downtown or whether it's a mega downtown or whether it's um, kind of the scale downtown we have now with um, centers and um, focusing on corridors too. So, At any point, I want people to interject questions, but um, just from a perspective of say Ray a Tower of 23 stories. Um, how many of those work around the city that is going to, you know, over the next 20 years of growth? Well, I mean, I think we'll, I think we'll see, we'll continue to see towers and mid-rise development, um, you know, and, and, and even smaller scale development, which I think is, 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 is as important as the, as the high rises. You know, different people have different, uh, different preferences, um, you know, that little development where we're up is in that Aaron and Hunter did. That's one of my favorite projects in town. I think that that does so much for that neighborhood. And, and some people want that scale. Now, I enjoy that scale a lot. But then there's other people who, who want to be in a full service building and want views and, and also want the concentration of density that you know that ultimately I think the Gulch has and that you know will it'll it'll continue to you know to have even more of as, as as we go forward. I think there's a place for, for all of it. Um, I think that the you know the high rises will probably tend to be concentrated in an area around other high rises, um, and that probably makes some sense. But I think to your earlier question about where are all these people going to go, I and mean, I think a lot of it depends on what we decide to do about mass transportation. 
um, because I think developers, people are going to come no matter what, and developers are going to develop no matter what. And, and if if there is if there if, if we follow through on 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 an initiative to create a grid and actually commit to a to a you know a, a significant mass um, mass transit you know source, I think that you're going to see developers, I mean, I know I will, I mean, I think you see developers flock to, to be on that grid and, and want to be able to, uh, you know, take advantage of what will absolutely be a buyer preference to be on that grid. I mean, if you can walk outside your door and pop on something that, you know, that not only is the grid itself, but then is interconnected with, you know, things like the green circuit and other, other, other forms, I think it sets itself up for even another link to be able to, you know, come in from, you know, the other counties. Um, but you first have to establish a grid. So I think, you know, how, where those 200,000 people go, I think more than anything will be defined by, by how we handle that question. I, I think we wholeheartedly agree with that because it's what we've seen in other cities. And it's, it's not only our, we brought up the term renter by choice, and we see that as much in our projects as, as um, other projects. But there's also, there's also a contingent that is going to be uh, transit user by choice. And they are going to want that. That's a that's another part of their lifestyle that they're they're trying to fit into. Because they're not just popping up from nowhere. These 200,000 people, some of them are going to, going to be generated here, but a lot of them are going to be moving in to, from other places that they're used to, uh, those sorts of amenities. And that's what's going to help that growth of Nashville if we're able to provide the same amenities that they're used to in other places. How does the panel feel about inclusionary zoning as a fix for that? Inclusionary zoning? You want to maybe just explain it a little bit? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it, it's just a zoning requirement where a certain percentage of units in a building would be dedicated to affordable housing. So it's a mandate. And is that something we're looking at here? You can say. That yeah. wasn't something we discussed today, but that idea is out there. It's, uh, we've got a project that we're looking at doing in Boulder, Colorado, and they, they have the application there. And I don't, I can't quote the percentages right off hand, but they leave you options, and it's such that the, the price out there is outrageous as far as rents go to even Nashville. It's, it's, uh, it's 20 cents higher. But, um, so the price of land is much higher. Uh, one of the alternatives they have is that you either provide the percentage um, in, in your project or you can purchase land elsewhere to provide those units and basically give the land to the city so that somebody, they can either sell it or they can develop them themselves. Um, or I, I think it was just pay a premium per unit to the city itself over and beyond what you would pay for land or putting them in, into your development. So as we're starting to look at a couple of different sites out there, we're, it's, it's challenging to figure out what is the best scenario when you're trying to mix the high-end market rents with the affordable component. And while it's important, I guess one good thing is to see all these different projects is that Nashville's providing a lot of different opportunities. And I think those opportunities much as anything, or just it says something about Nashville being able to do that rather than everybody coming into Nashville and, and immediately going to the high end uh, components. So it's good to see all the, the flexibility. But it, it's a challenge. I would, it'd be interesting to see if y'all do come up with something at some point. My, my, my opinion on that is I think it's a, I think it might be a, maybe not the best tool to have it relate specifically to a project because I think a project's going to you know run the gamut in terms of what who it's going to be geared for and to just sort of automatically, you know, like if you just sort of use the extremes, right? If it's a super ultra luxury high end project and then you're gonna try to put, you know, an affordable component in there, I mean, does that really work? And how long does that last? And you know, are you really just sort of picking people to become big winners? Because I mean I think as we saw in the last go round where you, you know you have a limit so you really, in theory, you help somebody for a few years, but but then they 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 win. I mean, they, they get the benefit of, of all of a sudden, you know, as opposed to it continuing on and and, 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 and being kind of more sustainable. I think um, you know was maybe might be a better better approach. Um, 
Well, we have a housing trust fund now, right? So is that, um, what's the function of that one? Is it, have, have any projects been funded yet? No, no, no projects have been funded yet, and that's one of the things also that we're looking at is to be able to get a sustainable source of income to be going to the housing trust fund to help provide that on a long-term basis. The, the, the affordability not only hits on new construction, what do you do with new construction, but it also hits with the, 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 the 60 year old who's got their house is sitting there and they had an $80,000 house, but they're sitting in an area where all this growth is coming and how do you keep that house affordable that they can pass it down to their, to their kids or it, become, it still becomes an affordable house when it flips or it all of a sudden is it, is it going to flip and the next guy comes in on the $80,000 house and does a $100,000 renovation to it for sale for $350,000. So those are some of the questions that National Next is trying to look at. It, it, those are the big questions. It has uh, a lot of people concerned, uh, a lot, especially a lot of people who are living in lower income neighborhoods, is how do I, how do I, they, they like having, they like having some of the benefits of what the new developments provide, but at the same time, they like their neighbors and they like who's living there and they don't necessarily want to see them all move out and get replaced by a new generation of people with the, with the, and lose that neighborhood feeling that they've had for so many years. Uh, in the development, how much, um, how much of the investment goes into the trim and the amenities and, you know, Walnut well, cabinets and, and, and courts, kind of and things like that. Um, what's, I guess, I think, uh, uh, like when I go and visit, uh, I know Nashville isn't compared, but when I go visit my friend in New York, there's a very, very, obviously, very small, very simple apartment, and that there's no amenities in this building, and that forces him to kind of go out into the city, so he has to go find a gym, and he has to go find a restaurant. There's nothing in his building. So I wonder, is there any space for simple development um, that would be you know, simple furnishings, simple design features um, that would cost like any bit? I mean, I don't know if it's significant or not, but the kind of the quality of the equipment the construction um, and how much it if reduced to more simple materials, that would translate into small, like a lower rent or lower, I don't know, I don't know how much that goes into it. Um, take a shot, take a shot at that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I think there's actually a lot of different development going on here in Nashville, a lot of different price points. I mean, you know, it's amazing to me some of the things that I see happening in East Nashville and, and Salem Town and, and, you know, parts of Germantown that, you know, I think people would have been maybe a little worried, you know, going through at night, now, you know, last night, my kids, we went to Rolf and Daughter and walked two blocks, you know, in the dark and felt totally fine, had a great time. And, and I think everyone's starting to feel that way and all these neighborhoods are, are, are creating some, are, 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 I guess, spawning some really creative developments that aren't all, you know, top end, high dollar, you know, either price, from a pricing standpoint or from a rental standpoint. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, as the city evolves, I mean, you're talking about the amenities and the, the high-rises and the buildings. I mean, you go to Portland, no, there's not a building in Portland that has a gym um, that I know of, that I've been in, um, because they have these incredible gyms in the Pearl District that you walk to. And that's just the way that it is. If you're a developer, you feel it's wonderful. You don't have to pay for it. You can put units in where you would otherwise put the gym. Now, Na Nashville's challenge is, is that we're, I mean, we didn't even have condo high-rises seven years ago, since, you know, I mean, to speak of. Um, and so, and, and we, of course, we didn't have any of the amenities or any of the retail or any of those services around either. So we're, we've made up a ton of ground and, and, it, and it wouldn't surprise me that if in 10 years, you know, buildings have less interior amenity and, and are really more about getting you into a neighborhood and getting you into an area where you're, you know, you're leveraging all of those things outside the building. Um, but it's a little tricky on the front end because, you know, somebody's gonna come in and pay you know, the kind of prices that a developer ultimately needs to make the numbers work, you, you've got you to have a good bit of that in, in the building. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> this past summer we did a uh, study with the University of Tennessee College of Architecture where they 
looked at something called microhousing in downtown, and this, these really small units that don't have all these amenities. But the idea is, um, you know, that's a that's a very specific type of person that wants that, but it's cheaper for that person. And then you're right in the middle of the city, so you have access to the amenities that are around you. Downtown. Do you think the millennials want that? Sorry. The millennials. I mean, is that going to be the millennial as this generation takes over? I'm not a millennial. But I wouldn't mind. <laughs> All right, I, uh, I apologize, like we've run over this time, but I want to, let's take one more question, and then uh, if these guys want to stick around for just a few. Uh, there was a lot said about bringing in all these great ideas from other cities, and I think that's a no-brainer, it's why we invent the wheel, but what particular things do you guys see in Nashville that we can do to have other cities look to us and say, we want to do it like they did in Nashville? I, 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 I just read an article today about the top 10 new design ideas for, for hospitality. Because we take a lot of our design cues from hospitality. Just the way that hotels are done now is, is really incredible. A big part of what they, uh, three or four out of the top 10 ideas, was how to make, how to bring in the local. Whether it's art, whether it's materials, whether it's the views, whether it's the neighborhood, and uh, that fits right in with everything that we're, we try to do. We're not always successful, but to bring in um, local artists, to bring in local craftsmen, to bring in the indigenous materials for both the neighborhood and the region, um, those are the things that we strive for, and for everywhere, because we can't just, I, we 100% agree, you can't just stamp out projects and uh, make them generic and expect everyone to love it. Kind of like we were talking about in the presentation. We're trying to, we as a, as a company try to um, enhance the neighborhoods that we're in with the projects that we do. Uh, and so that's, that would be our answer, is, is trying to involve that in that very local environment uh, with every project that we're doing. Um. I'll take a shot at that, it's a little different than, than his. Um, one thing that I think that we've done here that every city should, should, should emulate or should try to figure out how to do if it's not too late, because for most cities it's too late, but, but putting our arena and perhaps our football stadium too, but, but particularly the, the hockey arena, which is, as we know, is not just a hockey arena, it's, I guess, the sixth most, you know, sixth highest, highest revenue generating uh, performance center in the country, um, putting that right in the middle of, of our city was such an unbelievably smart move, and, and that's going to pay dividends so long. I mean, I, by example, when I, I moved here in 2000 from uh, Fort Lauderdale, and maybe a, two years prior to that, they were wrestling with where to, you know, their hockey owner wanted a stadium, and they were trying to decide whether to put it in downtown Fort Lauderdale on a piece of property that we were actually doing a development on, or moving into the suburbs out near the Everglades and, you know, in a suburban city by the name of Sunrise. And, you know, it would have been more expensive, obviously, to do it downtown, but it was actually doable. It was doable. They could have done it. It would have been an incremental cost. I mean, back then, you know, land prices, I mean, everything hadn't gone crazy. And they decided not to do it. Well, fast forward, that team's losing $20 million a year. Um, they've got their hands out again. They've retraded the deal that they, they, the money that they got to originally finance the stadium. And, and, and they're now saying that they need the city and this county government and everybody else to build them a downtown around the arena out there in the suburbs so that people want to go and spend. I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, just throwing good money after bad, basically. But, but it was really, I mean, it, 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 as I watched them build this, you know, convention center and this wonderful hotel and, and integrate them all and then on top of it to sort of put an entrance on the back that welcomes, you know, welcomes all of the people that are coming into the conventions and staying in the hotel to, to come in and, and, and actually go to a hockey game or go to a performance there. I mean, that is just going to, I mean, that's phenomenal. And, and the fact that we, we, as a city, we've been so blessed to have mayors that have been willing to take on these big projects and not just get them done, but get them done and, and, and really do them the right way. I mean, I think, you know, the city is, is, is a different city because of that. I might just add to it, I mean, you mentioned earlier too, just how young Nashville is in this kind of an apartment market. 
I mean, most of like Raleigh, they ahead of us. Um, most of the smallest of the city of Plano are recognized in the national world, uh, the Plano, Texas. Um, and I think they they look to us, they, they see us grow, and they want to see what we can achieve. And I don't know that we're there yet as far as on the map goes to say that anybody necessarily wants to end it. I think exactly right with a lot of the things to be done, but I think everybody's kind of looking to Nashville at this point in time and kind of understanding what it all, all the pieces and parts are that we are putting together. You know, I think the transit is going to be, if we can get it, would be would be huge. Um, I think, you know, somebody else asked a question about uh, the market rents and all of that. I think Nashville right now, because of it's just now growing, and what investors are looking for, they are able to achieve the higher rents. I think it's you know, all about targeting the market. At some point, it likely will get to a point where the pipeline is such that we're not building the, the higher end, and maybe some of those other developments recognize that there is a, a market now for some of the, the, the lesser rents out there. But, uh, I mean, Nashville's in a, in a good place. And, uh, I haven't heard anybody go somewhere, I haven't gone anywhere and say, I love how you did this or that. They just like Nashville in general. I mean, I think people love the eclectic, artsy music, all of the part of Nashville as much as anywhere. And I know we can talk about this for another hour, but <laughs> I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. And also, I think it's it's uh, it's symbolic of the energy that everybody's talking about here that you all came out on such a cool night and, you know, to listen to this. So thank you all again. Please help me thank our guests.